Good morning. So today what I want to do is continue on with my Jennifer Hill series that I'm doing. Again, let's uh, look at a little case synopsis of this. Jennifer Hill was a 12-year-old victim who went missing October 19th, 1973 from South Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Um, her body was found October 28th. Uh, in a cornfield a couple miles from where she was last seen. Subsequently, within that month, and I have it here somewhere, but not, not off the top of my head, uh, uh, an individual named Kim Hubbard was not only arrested, later on he was convicted and sentenced to 10 to 20 years for the murder of Jennifer Hill. Kim Hubbard has always maintained his innocence. And when I got involved in the case in 2013, uh, I met with Mr. Hubbard a few times and then shared some emails and then all communication ceased between us. And I'll get into those interactions later on. But... What I want to do today is go over interviews, timelines, um, very important key individuals being interviewed in regards to this crime. Now, the other day I had gone back to the site where Jennifer Hill was last seen walking and I did walk that area 50 years later. And you'll see that later on in a video that I did um, and went back to the same location to where her body was found. Obviously, a lot of things have changed since 1973, not only socially, but physically in that area as well. So it was a little difficult for me uh, to pinpoint the exact location where her body was found without any help from anybody, which I certainly could have gotten, but... Uh, you know, I'm just a loner. I, I kind of like to do things alone and figure out things on my own. So I did that, and I must say, I, I, I went through the whole case file again. I read it because I am a much different investigator now than I was 10 years ago when I first looked at this case. So I was unbiased then. And I'm unbiased now, but I feel just like with anything, I'm a better investigator with time, with experience, just like any vocation as a teacher. You know, you're a rookie teacher, you're in there teaching. Ten years later, you've learned nuances. You've learned what to say to calm the situation. You know what to say to escalate a situation. No different here. Uh, so... I wanted to go back and look at it and see if there was anything that stood out to me on either side. And I did catch a couple of things that make me raise an eyebrow. Now, let me preface this by saying there's some things in this case file that I see that raise an eyebrow or do something to me on both sides, meaning... I see it in Kim Hubbard's and his supporters' eyes on some things. For example, uh, you know, Kim Hubbard maintains he was framed. Uh, that, that's the gist of it. He was framed. Not that he's innocent. I've never, I, I never personally heard that from him. Because when I approached him, 
and I was looking at an unbiased way, I'm looking at it as, okay, somebody else murdered this girl. If that's the case, when I talk to Kim, let me see what his thoughts are. So when I said about one of the key pieces of evidence being a boot print found underneath, and we'll get into why that's so important, underneath the victim's body was matched to his boot print. But I wanted to, to know, hey, could another boot make this print, right? I mean, that that's pretty obvious is something you want to look into. <clears throat> I mean, if there's a uh, thousand types of those boots, hundred thousand types of those boots made, and let's say in that town vicinity of 30 miles, there's 30 pair of those boots. <clears throat> well, you got 30 suspects and you have to eliminate them, right? So my question to Kim, after I had read everything, when I talked to him, was could that boot print been made by somebody else? And his exact words were to me, no, that was my boot print. But I was framed or it was planted. That stuck to me. And then I went back and I wrote that in my report because it was something that stood out to me. I, w I wasn't expecting that response. What I was expecting was probably something like, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely, because I didn't do it. You know, I didn't get that. And I'll get into the evidence because it's very crucial, obviously, probably on a, the next video. Because if I did all of this in just one video, it's probably going to be five or six hours long. There's that much stuff to go over. And I'm not going to be able to get to everything. I'm not going to answer everybody's questions. But I'm trying to make it as comprehensive as possible on both sides. I mean, I think that I'm going to show you things that is going to make you believe that Kim Hubbard was innocent. There's no way he could have done it. I won't get into all of the, the little things that he says because some of them are just, they're, they're too far out there for me. Okay. One of them, you know, and I'll address it, but like the body being refrigerated and then found in the corn and then replaced back in the corn and stuff like that. We'll, we'll get into what his claims are, but there's, there's a lot of little things that I just don't think are relevant. They're relevant to him and his supporters. But for me, I always say in the first 50 to 100 pages in a police report, and that's being generous. You're going to find the suspect, generally. And that's not always. It's not always foolproof, okay? But once you look at the crime scene, see how the victim is, what the manner of death is, uh, th things like that, the cause of death, what was used, the instrument, how they were placed, if they were placed, you know, if there's a signature... All those things will tie it into or at least eliminate possible suspects. So let, I just want to focus right now. I'd already given you the background of the case kind of in a previous video. So in this video, I just want to go over the timeline and the interviews that were conducted. So on October 19th, Jennifer Hill goes missing. Now, the, one of the biggest contentions in this case is the timeline. That there is not enough time for Kim Hubbard to commit this crime. I, I disagree with that. Now, when I went back over today, and pretty much all week, his timeline, and the timeline of this case... There are discrepancies, but 
The discrepancies aren't because somebody's lying. It's because nobody was looking at it as I have to know exactly what time Jennifer Hill left this house because she's going to be murdered. No, nobody thought that, you know. So times might be off, give or take five, ten minutes maybe, maybe as much as 15 to a half an hour. Now what defense attorneys will do is when they get a timeline from a police report, that's their job is to pick inconsistencies out. It's their job. Hey, Jennifer, Kim Hubbard could not have committed this crime because Jennifer Hill, according to Jennifer Hill's mother, left that house at four o'clock. It says it right here. Well, maybe Jennifer Hill's mom did say that initially, okay? Because um, her, her, her daughter hadn't been found murdered yet. She's missing, okay? There's still hope. There's still possibility. She's found murdered. Okay, things just got real, okay? Now, me as an investigator, I'm setting Miss Hill down, and I, you know, I'm grabbing her by the shoulders. I'm comforting her, but I'm telling her, listen. Please listen to me. I know this is a very, very difficult time in your life. I, there's, there's nothing I can say. There's nothing that I can say to make you feel any better. I understand that, but look at me. We have to get down to the details. The minute details that you might not think are important. And we have to figure out when you called the Kim Hubbard residence and what time that was to the um degree. So let's think, okay? Then, you know, maybe she's like, all right, television was on. The match game was on. Okay, well, that gives an investigator something. It was, it was just ending. Okay, you go back to the old TV guide. What time did this play? Oh, it's over at 4 o'clock. So you're saying that you called the house right before? Yes. Okay. Things like that. That's what's important. So then timelines change a little bit. It's not because somebody's lying. Okay? If somebody's lying in a timeline, it's not the time discrepancy that's important. It's the location that's important. That's when you know somebody's lying. If you interview Kim Hubbard and he says uh, at 4.30, I was at the Humdinger eating. Okay. How long were you there? 25 minutes. Okay. And then 10 days later, you interview Kim Hubbard and he says, at 4.30, I was at the car wash. Well, okay, that's not a time discrepancy, right? That's an alibi discrepancy. That's a location discrepancy. And then, okay, now I'm a little worried. So think about that as we go into these timelines. And another thing that I wanted to try to figure out, and I think I figured it out, because there's no report anywhere that just starts out saying Kim Hubbard is a suspect because of this, 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 and this. That doesn't exist here. But the way the Pennsylvania State Police write their report, at least back then, everything is pretty much, you know, general. Like, and not general, but there's no suspect list. And if you don't have a suspect, then once you have an assus a suspect or an accused all of a sudden, that accused or suspect's name will appear at the beginning of every report. Well, that happened here. You know, you're reading along, reading, 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 nothing, nothing, and then all of a sudden, suspect, Kim Hubbard, on, on everything. And I am trying to figure out, well, what happened that made him a suspect? Because 
one of his contentions and his supporters' contentions is that he was, you know, I guess um, a bad kid, you know, or, or something to that extent. He was frowned upon. I don't know. He was vulgar. There's stuff in here in the report about people saying that he would talk to his mom very poorly, use cuss words in public, very vulgar, very rough. Listen, does that make you a suspect? No. No, it doesn't mean that you killed anybody. Okay? Uh, but his supporters, and I think, I think, and I don't want to speak for Kim Hubbard because I, I would never do that, he, it seemed like that's the reason they targeted him. But he firmly believes that he was framed. So, I start seeing reports with his name on it as a suspect. Where, why, how did this happen? So, let's look at Jennifer Hill's mom's interview. The victim's mom. She is interviewed on the 25th. Now, she was interviewed, you got to remember, this was originally a, a South Williamsport police case. And then at some point in time, into the disappearance, and I have it marked here, I thought I marked it down here, at some point in time on the 23rd, so Jennifer Hill goes missing, missing on the 19th of October. On the 23rd of October, the South Williamsport Police bring in state police, meaning that, hey, we need help. We can't find this girl. It's been four days now. She's not a runaway. Um, we don't believe, although there was a, a disagreement, and which is very important. There's a disagreement on the last phone call from Jennifer Hill's mom to Jennifer Hill at the Hubbard residence around... 4 o'clock, 3.45, 4 o'clock, and where, where Jennifer did not want to come home. She wants to go to a football game later that night. Um, Jennifer Hill's mom says, no, you need to come home. So, I don't know the extent of that argument, even if it was an argument. It might not even been an argument. It's just, hey, come home. No, I don't want to. I don't care. Come home. Okay, bye. You know, there's no indication anywhere from Jennifer Hill's mom or Ruthie Hubbard, who was there with her, with Jennifer Hill, when this phone call was placed. It's just, I, I think it's just typical 12-year-old stuff. You know, hey, I want to stay at my friend's house longer. I don't want to come home. No, you got to come home. So, on the 25th of October, this is not the first time she's interviewed, okay? But this is the first time the state police interview her. Jennifer Hill is still missing. Norma Hill says, I made the call at 3.45 for Jennifer to come home. I called the Hubbard residence where Jennifer Hill had spent the night previously. At 4.15, she still isn't home, okay? She should be home because it only takes, let me break out my notes here and let you know how long that it takes to walk. So from the Kim Hubbard residence where she was last quote unquote seen, last place her mom talked to her, to Jennifer Hill's home on Hastings Street, is 0 0.7 miles. It's a sh almost a straight shot. And it takes 17 minutes to walk that. So, go. let's go back to Norma Hill's interview on the 25th of October. I call there at 345. Tell Jennifer to come home. At 415, she's not home yet. 17 minute walk. She called at 345. She should be home right around 4 o'clock. She's not. 
Mom gives her an extra 15 minutes leadway. 14 or 415. She's not home yet. Should have been home 15 minutes ago. Jennifer Hill's mom, Norma, tells her older daughter, Jackie, hey, call the Hubbard residence again. See where Jennifer's at. At 4.15, Jackie now calls the Hubbard residence. The Hubbard residence, the mom and daughter, Ruthie, related Jackie. She already left. There's no panic yet. Okay? She's a little late. But she had already left. And she's saying now, this is coming right from her interview on the 25th, between 4.30 now, so now she is a half an hour late getting home, and she already left, between 4.30 and 4.45, Jennifer Hill's dad, you know it's important now when, when dad gets involved. Dad calls the Hubbard residence looking for his daughter. Kim, the accused, the convicted, now answers the phone and says, no, she, Mom, where, where's Jennifer? Well, she left. That, that is troublesome. For the prosecution. Okay? The crux of this case when it comes to a timeline is not really when Jennifer Hill leaves. It's this. When Mr. Hill calls the Hubbard residence looking for his daughter and he speaks to Kim Hubbard. Because now, what is that? That's an alibi. It's an odd alibi, right? The victim's dad is Kim Hubbard's alibi. It's not a visual alibi, but it might as well be. Kim Hubbard answered the phone. Now, the prosecution wants you to believe that he just, he's already murdered Jennifer Hill. This 19, 20 year old kid has already murdered somebody, dumped the body. Come back home and takes the phone call from the victim's father and callously says, Hey, Mom, where's Jennifer at? Did she leave yet? That's scary on both parts. It's scary that if Kim Hubbard did do this crime, that he's that cold. scary on the prosecution's point because now they have a timeline that they have to fit Kim Hubbard murdering this person this person this beautiful girl and fit it within that timeline now this morning when I was reading over these timelines one of the things that made me believe that Kim Hubbard was telling the truth that I picked up on here that I didn't pick up on 10 years ago. He's telling the truth about this, this very specific phone call from Jack Hill, not about anything else. But when Jack calls and I believe his name is Jack. I apologize if it's not. Miss, I just should say Mr. Hill. I'll give him you know, the respect he deserves. Mr. Hill calls and asks for Jenny. When Kim turns and says to mom and to his sister, is Jenny here? And they say, no, she left like half an hour ago or whatever it is. Is a statement given on the same day by Ruth. Ruth is interviewed multiple times. And remember, this is Jennifer Hill's friend. It's Kim Hubbard's sister. And she, to me, comes off extremely truthful. And again, she's 12 years old. She has no reason to lie. 
And one of the things she says, and it's only, it's, I only seen it once. I saw it this morning in one of her maybe five, six interviews. And it was only a little snippet, like a half a sentence. It said, Kim came home three minutes after the victim left. She has no reason to make that up. Three minutes, that is very telling to me. That To me, that's somebody that's telling the truth. Because it's not five minutes, it's not ten minutes. It's three minutes. So if that's the case, when Kim is talking to Mr. Hill on the phone, Kim and Jennifer never past each other. You see what I'm saying? Jennifer leaves. Three minutes later, Kim comes pulling in with his car. Now, maybe he passed the victim. Maybe. But maybe he's telling the truth. He gets home three minutes after Jennifer leaves. Walks in the door, doing whatever he's doing. Phone rings. Hello? Yeah, where's my daughter? She spent the night at you guys' place. Did she leave? Hey, Ruthie, where's Jennifer? She left three minutes before he got home. Again, it's very important going over cases, finding little things that you didn't see. So, One of the other things that Ruthie was very adamant on was that, and she made it a point to call the police and say that, and I'm sure it was with mom's direction or, or father's direction, not sure. I'm sure she didn't do it on her own, but maybe she did at age 12. To call and say, hey, the victim should have in her pocket some soap and some corn from Halloween. When you're younger, that's what you used to do. And when I read that again this morning, I had read it in the past, but when I read her interview and she mentioned that again, I got a very sinking feeling in my stomach. And I'll tell you why. Because when I found Jennifer Hill's clothing 40 years later, and I went through her pockets I found that bar of soap and it was all shriveled up you know from being <laughs> in a pocket locked away for 40 years and I just I remember it and it was very surreal very surreal as it is right now thinking about that I don't know why it just it just was in that bag of corn that she had as well. It's crazy how certain things hit you, you know. All right. Took a little break there. Let's move on to another interview that I find very important. And that's the interview of Joe Hubbard. Now, this would be Kim's father, who fought tooth and nail after the conviction of Kim Hubbard to free his son. I mean, he met with state police. He did a lot of things, um, as, as any family member should. Okay, I, I don't I don't blame Joe Hubbard or, or, or any of the Hubbard family for sticking up for Kim. It's what family does. I used to think that I had enough balls or enough conviction to say, well, if somebody in my family committed a heinous act, I would turn them in. Well, the older I got, I realized that that isn't necessarily true. Okay, you stick up for family. You know, the saying blood is thicker than water. There's a lot of merit to that. 
you know, like Billy the Kid said too, and, and Young Guns, you know, if you're my friend, there's nothing I'd fail to do. And I would put that to family. So, Joe Hubbard is interviewed on the 26th of October. Now remember, Jennifer Hill's body's not found until the 28th. And I, I bring this up because things can change. Right now, you have a person that's missing. They could still be alive. They could be a runaway. They could have been a kidnap victim. Whatever it is, they could have got lost. Could have suffered from dementia. Whatever it is. She's not dead. In people's eyes, except for the suspect. He's the only person that knows. Okay? No one else in the world knows. We just have a missing person. Once a body's found, and then you start interviewing people, and trust me, once a body's found, those interviews ramp up. They are tighter, they are more purposeful, and it and it's ironic. You would think it would be the other way around. We need to find this person before something happens to them. Yes, a lot of focus, a lot of work's being done when she's missing. But once there's a homicide, it's everything goes into a higher gear. And then when you interview people, that's when you start looking for inconsistencies, okay? Because the suspect, whoever it is, that's when his story is going to change. Because in their mind, hey, I killed this person, I buried them, not in this case, but I mean, or I dismembered them, not in this case, got rid of, dumped them in the, in the river, not in this case. But they did something to more than likely hide their crime. And in this case, it put the body in a cornfield. So whoever did it is possibly trying to hide the crime. And I say possibly because you don't know what they were doing in that cornfield to begin with. You don't know whether that is a dump location where the person was killed elsewhere, which... The prosecution, I believe, believes, which I don't, or they were killed there in that cornfield. And that's what I believe. But the interview will change of, of the suspect. That's when discrepancies are going to be noticed. Okay? Also, behaviorally, things are going to change in a person for the most part. That's going to be important here when we look at these interviews with Joe, Joe Hubbard, the father. So on the 26th, he's interviewed. Jennifer Hill's still missing. He says, she left our place at 4.10. 4.10 p.m. We look back at Norma Hill when she calls the first time, 3.45, hey, get home. 4.15, her older daughter Jackie calls. Hey, she already left. Well, now things aren't making, they're making sense because Joe says that she left at 4.10. Okay. That makes sense. Jackie says when she called at 4.15, she already left. Joe is saying at 4.10, she left. Okay, look, now we got two people that are cooperating each other. And they're from different sides. <laughs> two fa different families. Okay, so we can assume that 410 is the time we can go by that she left. And Kim Hubbard isn't home. Now, Remember when I said there's some things that make me a little uncomfortable? And only, maybe it's because I don't understand. This is one of them. On the 28th of October, now this is the day the body is discovered. Yet, the body isn't discovered until 4 o'clock on the 28th. On 
19 on the 28th. So approximately, what, two hours and 45 minutes before the body's found? Three hours before the body's found? Joe Hubbard is interviewed again. This time, he's, he's advised of his rights. Now, that is troublesome to me only because I don't understand it. It's very possible that he, at this point in time, may be a suspect. But, remember what your rights are, okay? You're not given rights when you're a witness. You are given rights when you are a suspect. Now, Joe Hubbard's not listed anywhere in any of these official police reports as a suspect. Nowhere. Although I hear it a lot when I'm out and about and people want to bring this case up to me. I hear it all the time. But he's read his rights before the body's even discovered. I have not seen that done. I'm not saying it hasn't been done. I just haven't seen it done. I don't know why, and that's troublesome to me. Why are they reading his, his rights before a body's even discovered? Is it because they're erring on the side of caution? Yeah, even though it appears from the report that he came in voluntarily, but I'm sure there was a a conversation, a phone call that, that preceded that. Hey, can you come in? We need to talk to you. Yes. Comes in, he gets read his rights, and then he's interviewed. Maybe that's normal that I just haven't seen it. Maybe they're just erring on the side of caution and saying, hey, he might say something that is tangible that we need that points to him. So, but no, normally you're a suspect. But there's no indication anywhere that he's listed as a suspect and I see no reason why he is a suspect in this case. Yet he's read his rights at 1.15 before the body's discovered. Now, a lot of Kim Hubbard supporters will jump on it. That's the thing. I'll say something, and people like to twist it or make it fit their narrative. When you shouldn't do that. Just let it ride. It's the truth. Okay? You don't have to make it fit nothing if it's the truth. At 13, 15 hours, he was read his rights, and he was interviewed. That's it. Doesn't mean Kim's innocent doesn't mean Kim's guilty. It's just a fact. Now, let's jump forward to November 3rd. Bodies found on October 28th. November 3rd, everything is ramped up. Okay, what I want to do is now jump forward to November 3rd. Why November 3rd? November 3rd is the next time that Joe Hubbard is interviewed, where he gives very incriminating statements and it's very important to this case Joe Hubbard is in the hospital he's in the hospital I believe because of a possible heart attack I could be wrong on that but that's how my memory serves me. What I am not wrong on is that the police went there to interview him. And what he had to say is of so much significance, I believe, to this case that I'm going to read it verbatim from the actual police report. Now, please bear with me. 
as I find it. Now, I pulled out a bunch of interviews that I felt were very important to this case. Now, here it is. Now, pay very close attention. This is November 3rd, body has already been found. And a Lieutenant Heineck went to the hospital to interview a patient in room 209. This individual name was Joe Hubbard. And this is what Joe Hubbard had to say. Now these are in quotations. I'm not making them up. It's in the police report. Did the lieutenant make these up to frame Kim Hubbard? I mean, that's not for me to judge. I guess that's for you. I see no reason why he would do that at this juncture. And I'm going to read exactly what Joe Hubbard said about his son, Kim. Remember, Joe Hubbard fought tooth and nail about Kim's innocence. Yet this is what he says. Kim had been acting unusual ever since Jenny was missing more so after she was found in the cornfield. The day that you talked to me at the house, that was last Wednesday, he got excited about the mud that was on his car. Kim told me that he got mud on his car when he was parking with his girlfriend Colleen down at the bottom of Allen Street. I told Kim there wasn't any mud at the bottom of Allen Street as the area down there is all cinder. Kim told me there was mud on the floor of his car. As far as Kim's mother, she will cover up for Kim all the time. She always has. Kim has been acting strange since this happened. He acts like a scared mouse. One thing that I can tell you about Kim is when he is lying, he gets loud and vulgar. My daughter, Ruthie, is not influenced by her mother but will tell the truth. I will speak out in court on this. My son, Kim, is not right. I would check on the receipt where Kim got the buffer that Friday to see if the time on the store receipt was right and had not been changed. I don't think he had his car washed that day. Also, getting back to the car. When you took the car that Wednesday, Kim made a remark about what you were going to find in the car. I know that my wife, Doris, will not cooperate cooperate with you in any way. She won't tell you anything if she felt that it would hurt Kim. I'm going to tell you something and I want you to remember what I tell you. If you go to pick a Kim up, be very careful. My wife told me last night here at the hospital that if the police come to get Kim, they will never take her or Kim alive. She will do anything to protect Kim. She was asking me about the shells that go in shotguns. I have Two at the house, so be very careful. You could talk to Kim's girl again, Colleen. I won't say the last name. I told you she is 17 years old and lives in Du Bois Town. You could talk to her to see if she ever lived down in that area. Also to see if they ever parked down in that area that we were talking about. If I think of anything else, but it's hard for me to think of anything else that would help you the way things are. Things are mixed up for me. Come back and see me. Wow, right? What do you think about that? Do you think Mr. Hubbard is lying? Do you think the state police made up that whole little thing? Absolutely not. They didn't make that up. Kim's dad said that. Now why? Maybe it's, it's just what it is. Simple truth. Other people want to point to the fact, like I said earlier, that he's responsible himself for this death. Although he has an alibi. He has a physical alibi. But what people can say, and Kim Hubbard and his supporters do say this, Jennifer Hill was not killed on the 19th of October when she went missing. In fact, she was killed closer to when the body was found. And their evidence is that 
they believe that she was refrigerated and I will get into all that on another video when I talk about the evidence. Remember, we're just talking right now about timeline and interviews. Now, remember what I had said earlier about behavioral patterns. Oftentimes, when somebody commits the act of murder and they're not a serial offender, they will go through behavioral changes and you, they'll be noticeable. Maybe it is, hey, somebody that doesn't drink alcohol is suddenly drinking alcohol. Maybe it's somebody that smokes cigarettes is now smoking four packs a day. There is a marked significance in the change of someone's behavior. Not always. There's sociopaths out there that don't care. Hell, they, they'll kill somebody, they'll dismember them, they'll go upstairs, brush their teeth, eat a steak with blood on their hands, and then they'll go to the grocery store and talk to the victim's families as if nothing happened. Okay? But if we are to believe Joe Hubbard, and I, I believe that there's, there's some people that say that this doesn't exist. I believe I heard that I th from somebody in the Hubbard camp. That I, I, I made it up because I think I included that in my, my book. Uh, I, it exists. It's right there. You know, I, I have no reason to lie. That's, that is always such a big... Uh, I don't even know what to explain. When people say that I, that I make stuff up or I have made stuff up, uh, they say it because it doesn't fit their narrative. Just like when we're going to get into this evidence. You know, Kim Hubbard told me, you don't have it. And I understand why he said that. Because in his discovery, he got he got paperwork and he told me this. I got paperwork that says you're lying. But he didn't know me. I, I don't lie. There's no reason to lie. But I understand why he thought I was lying and said, you're lying because I have evidence of saying all the evidence was destroyed. Well, the funny thing is, I know exactly what he's talking about because in these these papers, this case file, the police reports, it does say. But guess what? It wasn't, and I found it. And we'll get into that with the evidence at another video. So you have Kim having a changed behavior, according to his dad. Okay. He's acting differently. He's acting scared. Now, maybe he's just acting scared because he may see where this investigation is going. If I was innocent and I put myself in Kim's shoes and I'm at that house and the police are coming, they're talking to me, they're interviewing me, and they're asking me certain questions, I can infer as a reasonable individual Hey, they're looking at me. I might become a little scared too. Now, the flip side of it, if he is truly guilty of this, and he's acting like, according to dad, a scared little mouse, maybe that's why, because he is guilty. But remember what his dad said in here. My son Kim is not right. That's significant to me. To have a father say that about their son. Now I don't know the relationship. Uh, again, but I do know that his father fought tooth and nail. To get Kim out of jail and to do his appeals and to prove that he was innocent. But yeah, he gave that interview. Now, as I sit here and look at it, remember when I said earlier about the suspect's name will be on the report? His name's on this report. Kim Lee Hubbard, white male, 20, 
1030 West Central Ave. So Kim's already a suspect in the police's eyes when they go and interview. And I, I know that he is. You know how I know that? Because on November 1st, November 2nd, and November 3rd, <coughs> police are doing surveillance on Kim Hubbard. <coughs> now, surveillance is something I know a thing or two about. Because it seems like my whole life, not my whole life, my whole police career, that's what I did. In the drug world, doing narcotic investigations, everything is surveillance. Surveillance, surveillance, surveillance. It's great intel. Um, and it's very boring, by the way. But they did surveillance on Kim's house and on Kim in general on November 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. So by November 1st, he's a suspect. Now, I pulled out a report of what they observed. And this is important because somebody, and I believe it what may have been one of the family members of Kim Hubbard. And remember, I was reluctant to do this video because this is the first time, first case that I ever got where I got pushed back from both the prosecutors and the defense. The prosecution because the paper misquoted me and said that it looked like Kim Hubbard was innocent when I was, and I, I have no idea where they got that. I never said that. Never. And I had a big uproar. State police were calling me, called my boss, the district attorney. Uh, the old mayor's son and prosecutor called, you know, so they had to run a retraction. Of course, the retraction on that wasn't on the front page where it should have been, you know, hey, Detective Maines didn't say that. It's not what he said. But I also had family members push back on me from the, the Hubbard side. Again, I understand that, you know. But they called me a liar, okay? When somebody doesn't understand something, that I guess, and that they don't know the person, that's what they can fall back on. And they said that I was lying about this surveillance report because the surveillance report, and I'm gonna pause this video until I can find it. All right, now I'm back because I, took me, it was really quick that I found this actually, but um, I'm going to read what the surveillance report says. That way, at least, you know, you can't say that I'm a liar. I guess you could. You could still say that, hey, I typed these up, okay? And uh, yeah, whatever idiots are going to say that don't believe you. But this is what surveillance on the 3rd of November, 1973, of Kim Hubbard and his residence showed. This writer parked and observed the suspect's residence from 2230, uh, which is 1030, 3 November 73 until 3 in the morning on November 4th. All downstairs lights were on upon arrival of this writer. Suspect Hubbard was observed in the downstairs area of the house and appeared to be pacing around the house without any top on the upper portion of his body. Now this is where they said I'm lying. At 23.45, so 11.45 at night, Suspect Hubbard was observed by this writer and Trooper Slocum striking his sister. Suspect was observed through the kitchen window and appeared to pull his sister's hair and strike her one time. At 005, so 12.05 a.m., Suspect Hubbard left his house and proceeded west on West Central Ave. The lights in the Hubbard residence were turned off around 2.30 and Suspect Hubbard was not observed re-entering his residence. However, it's possible he could have re-entered the residence through the rear door, which was not visible to the right. What's that tell you, if anything? 
It doesn't tell me anything other than the fact. He was observed striking his sister. Now, there's people that want to say that I'm lying about that. It's right there. Did the state police make that up? Why did he do it? I don't have any... I, I don't know that. Only he knows that and maybe the sister. Maybe it's possible that they, they observed something that looked like him striking and pulling her hair. I don't know. But I doubt it. I believe that to be the truth. Maybe it could show you that he has a violent temper. There's people that strike family members that don't have violent tempers and they had said the wrong thing or something. Now, the, the pro-prosecution, pro-law enforcement side will certainly have you believe, well, it shows more than likely that Ruthie or, you know, the sister confronted Kim about Jennifer, maybe called him a murderer, said, I know what you did. And therefore, he pulled her hair and struck her. You don't know that. You can't say that, you know. Uh, you have no idea. Maybe she was in the refrigerator and she was mad because... Kim ate the last piece of pizza. So she took a banana and threw it at him and it hit him in the neck. And they didn't see it. So he went over there and pulled her hair. Slapped her. You don't know. You cannot infer anything by that. You think you can. But unless you know the actual reason, you can't. Now... If you want to corroborate that, that right there with other people, say Hubbard's friends saying he was violent, he liked to fight, he was mean. <clears throat> okay. Now, this has, the actual event doesn't have context, but the behavioral pattern of the suspect now fits. Okay. We don't know why that happened, but we can believe that it did happen because of past interviews and proclivity to fighting. That's all it tells you, but it happened. I didn't make it up. In fact, I didn't make anything up of this case. I find it funny how people in the past, 10 years ago, well, however long ago it's been since I did this case, want to say that I planted evidence or I'm lying. I find it so funny and so unbelievable because I didn't convict the guy. I wasn't even born in 1973. I didn't arrest him. I wasn't on the jury. I could give two shits whether he did this or not. I have nothing against Kim Hubbard. If he in fact is guilty, he's a murderer. So what? I correspond with murderers all the time. Okay? I'm not deterred by them. I'm not scared by them. I can learn from them in my profession. And that's what I do. One individual on death row that I've been speaking to for a year for murdering his girlfriend's mother. I respect that guy. Okay, I still look at him as a human being, not a piece of trash. So, Kim Hubbard, do I have anything against him? No, not at all. I don't care for him one way or another. People contact me and say, hey, this guy's a jerk. He got kicked out of the gym for harassing girls. Oh yeah, I got that, that call. We bought a property. He's near it. He's given us all kinds of grief. He's a creep. 
I don't care. Right? That's nothing to do with me. I wrote a small chapter in a book because it was one of the cases that I did. I've done hundreds of cases. I reinvestigated re this case because I was told to. Yes, I volunteered. It was in our office. It was handed to me. I, yeah, I'll do it. It's my job. I spent a year on it. Okay, and came to the conclusion. I don't think my conclusion has changed much. However, there are some things, again, that trouble me. And we talked about a couple of them. Another one, you know, listen, the Kim Hubbard camp got all this documentation. They see the same things I see. If you're truly innocent, you are going to digest this and show why you're innocent. If you're guilty, but you want to try to make it look like you're innocent, you're going to do, and this is what Kim and his supporters have done, is pick apart inconsistencies. That's what defense attorneys do. Inconsistencies doesn't make a person innocent. Facts make a person innocent or guilty, one way or the other. Just because someone says in an interview it's 345 and another interviewer says it's 348, that doesn't mean there's a lie there because there's an inconsistency. Defense attorneys want to make it appear that way, and although in their mind they know also that it's not the case. But it's their job to point out inconsistencies. To make it look to the jury, there's reasonable doubt because of inconsistencies. Now, one of the things that, and, and I want to get back to, the jurors in this case saw fit to convict Kim Hubbard. Not me. Okay? Not me. It was the jury. Now, was it because has innocent people not only been arrested, but convicted? Absolutely. Absolutely. Have they been set free? Absolutely. O.J. Simpson. Just saying. Maybe the prosecution put on a better case than Kim Humbert's attorney. That's all it takes. Look at the OJ case. A little bit of reasonable doubt. Defense is much better than the prosecution. Innocent man. Well, not, not really. Being innocent and found not guilty is two different things. But Kim was convicted and it wasn't by me. All I'm doing is speaking out about the facts. And I think the Hubbard camp, they don't like that because it, it makes them look guilty. Well, I can't make you look any more guilty than the, the jury that convicted and sentenced you, right? I'm just giving the facts. Now, again, there's some things that I look at now later that I have a problem with. I had a problem then with this. And I don't know if you can see what I what I wrote there. Big issue. This is a map of Jennifer Hill's walk home. Remember it takes 17 minutes to walk home at 0.7 miles from 1030 Central Ave, which is the Hubbard residence, to 353 Hastings Street, which is Jennifer Hill's residence. 0 0.7 miles. It's a straight shot. Yet, Jennifer Hill 
is saw is she's seen by numerous people walking on Central Rav, which she should be. Okay. She's seen by an individual named Mundrick walking just past Kane Street. And then a block later, she is seen by oh, Gary Whiteman, who is now a district judge and was my police chief for a little bit and my patrol corporal. He's only 10 years old at the time. He sees her crossing over the street as well. And then all of a sudden, she walks uphill in a comp an opposite direction. She should be walking straight to go home. Then all of a sudden, she seems to take a right because she's next seen on Howard Street, which is three blocks north of where she should be walking to go home. And then there's this last sighting back on Central Ave, almost to her home. So we have four sightings of Jennifer walking home. Three of them match, meaning they're all on Central Ave. It's where she should be if she's going home. But we have one. And it's the most important sighting of them all. That doesn't make sense. Doesn't mean it's not true. But it doesn't make sense. It is three blocks north. Three blocks south. I'm sorry. From where she should be. Now this individual. Is in a but she's not interviewed until after the body's found. I have a big issue when I initially am tracking Jennifer's route home. There's no reason she should be seen up there. Yet she is. I'm thinking because I'm hesitating giving the name of the person just because I don't like to do that much. I will just say um, Betty. So what happens is that the body is found on the 28th. Please start doing a canvas of the area of just like they should. But Howard Street is not an area that's being canvassed. Because there's no reason she should be up there. As an investigator, you're seeing, okay, Whiteman's sighting is here. Um, Mundrick's sighting's here. That's the way she should be going. Mendez sighting is good. It's right almost by her house. It's right at the intersection. That's where she should be. That time and, and the time frame is good. Three sightings. I'm going to canvas everybody on that Central Ave on that 0.7 mile walk. Every house is going to be looked at. And they were. Did you see this girl? And only three people did. Now, Mendez, the very last one, he was did not live on Central Ave. He was driving through the area and saw, and he described the girl, and he described her very well. Okay? Described the number of the 33 jersey that she had on because that was his high school number. Very credible sighting. But the prosecution says it didn't happen. But yet, it's, it's on the line. It's on Central Ave. It matches the time that she would have been there. So why are they saying that that's not credible? Well, they're saying it's not credible because they're saying Betty on Howard Street saw her get into Kim Hubbard's vehicle. And if that's the case, there's no way 
that Mendez could have sold Jennifer where he did. So, what I want to get to is the sighting on Howard Street.